Thanks, Yvonne. Good morning and good to see everybody. Uh, to start with, I'd like to recognize the traditional and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Slavitude peoples whose lands were gathered on this morning. It's a real pleasure to be able to take part at this uh, digital effects conference and connect with people live after at least a couple of years. If you're unfamiliar with uh, Innovate BC, um, we're a crown agency of the province of British Columbia. We work under the direction of Ministry of Jobs, Economic Recovery, and Innovation. Our goal is to help foster innovation in British Columbia so that all British Columbians can benefit from a thriving, sustainable, and inclusive innovation economy. One of the most uh, fulfilling and exciting things that we do at Innovate BC is that we help scientists and researchers and innovators and entrepreneurs solve the biggest world's challenges and build great companies right here in British Columbia. We do this by providing them with access to talent, capital, mentorship, and market connections. We've had the privilege to work with many great companies throughout our programs and witness remarkable homegrown innovations that are making a huge difference in people's lives. Some of these companies are here today, and we're very pleased to support this conference and present five BC companies for this next session, which is BC Startups Building the Future with Data. We will hear from This Fish Inc., Lama Zoo, Pocketed, Nerickson Software, and Aqua Intelligent Technology, all trailblazers in their respective fields. And now I'd like to introduce our first two speakers for this part one of this session. Uh, first and foremost, uh, Eric Anotam. Eric is the CEO and co-founder of This Fish, Inc. Eric is recognized as a global leader in seafood traceability. He has more than 20 years experience in global fisheries and has 15 years experience in software and product development. He began working on seafood traceability in 2008 while working at EcoTrust Canada, the nonprofit which co-founded this fish inc. Eric was born and raised in a commercial fishing family, which goes back generations in Ukulet on Vancouver Island. And one very little known fact about Eric is that he has worked as a journalist and a foreign correspondent as well. And next, I'd like to introduce uh, Jay Milroy. Jay is the director of product development at Lama Zoo. Jay has spent the majority of his career working with emerging technologies from the early days of the dot com through the transformations of e-commerce, mobile, big data, blockchain, and now mixed reality. Currently, Jay is focused on transforming how we communicate and collaborate through Lama Zoo's spatial business intelligence platform. I'm excited to hear from both of you today and other amazing companies this afternoon as well. You are all helping put BC on the map as one of the fastest growing tech ecosystems in North America, which Chris kind of alluded to earlier this morning. If you have any questions about Innovate BC, feel free to connect with me and we'll provide you all the information that, that you need. And now I'm gonna turn it to uh, Eric to tell his story. Eric. Thanks. So. Uh I've uh, sort of named my uh, talk today, uh, The Data Effect, How to Build uh, Digital Seafood. So, you know, Canada is a country that's really built on uh, natural resources. I mean, generations of Canadians, uh, oh, here's a clicker, thank you. Uh, generations of Canadians, you know, were, were loggers, miners, and fishers. Uh, it's a story that I know well, uh, because my, <coughs> uh, my father was a, a fisherman, as, as you heard. So at this fish, our, uh, our mission is really to help drive profitability and sustainability in the seafood industry through better data, basically digital, real-time, and actionable. And we do this by providing software and artificial intelligence to the seafood sector. And as I mentioned, you know, generations of Canadians were miners, fishers, and uh, loggers. I know that story well because actually my father came to Canada as an Estonian refugee uh, fleeing the Russian invasion and occupation of the Baltic states at the end of the Second World War. So this is a photo of actually a number of, of my father and a number of Estonian refugees coming into the Halifax uh, harbor uh, shortly after the war. 
Uh, so when he arrived in Canada, he literally worked in every natural resource sector. He was in uh, forestry, he was in mining, he was hydroelectric, uh, and then he eventually ended up in Euclid on the west coast of Vancouver Island, where he married the daughter of a fisherman and became a fisherman himself. So, you know, we really like to romanticize the seafood industry, sort of that well-worn tale of the old man in the sea. Obviously, it's a story that I know very well, having been grown and or born and raised in a commercial fishing family. But it's equally true that actually seafood is the most globally traded protein on Earth. The industry is massive, global, and complex. Yet the information systems running the global supply chains are pretty archaic. Most of the data is trapped on paper. I kind of joke that it reminds me of the poem, The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. It's sort of data, data everywhere, but not a drop to sink. So all this paperwork is actually a big business problem. It's inefficient, it's air prone, which often leads to non-compliance, which is a big deal in the, in the food sector. But it's just, it's just not bad for business, it's actually bad for the planet too. Seafood has some of the most notoriously opaque supply chains. Illegal fishing, seafood fraud, even human slavery. These are the problems that are plaguing the global industry. Now, most environmental and human rights groups are calling for digitization and electronic traceability to improve the transparency of global seafood supply chains. But in such a complex, massive industry with literally millions of fishing vessels and farms on one side and millions of retailers and restaurants on the other, like, where do you start? Well, in the middle, there's only about 50,000 seafood processors in the world. This is the data bottleneck. It's the most critical node in the supply chain. So at this fish, what we have done is built software called Tally that enables seafood processors to digitize all their data in real time on the factory floor using IoT devices and tablet computers. We've effectively built a smart manufacturing platform for the seafood industry based on the latest advances in AI, IoT sensors, and advanced analytics. We really want to bring this ancient industry into the digital age. And so why do customers buy our software? Well, we uh, help to reduce the cost of data collection and management. Uh, we improve or strengthen process and inventory control, and ultimately improve compliance through electronic traceability. And we've proven that we can scale our software across a global fragmented market. From the largest lobster exporter in New Zealand to some of the biggest tuna canneries in Thailand and Ecuador. So what's going to cause uh, adoption of our technology? Well, this is what I call the fish and chips index. And since 1990, the absolute price of fish has gone up by 60%, while the price of semiconductors or computer chips has gone down by 40%. So this is one of the meta trends that is really driving technology adoption in the fishing industry. Technology is getting cheaper and fish is getting more expensive. But it's not just that trend, there's also a lot of market and regulatory drivers, about 50 of them over the last 20 years. The EU really uh, set the stage about 12 years ago when they brought in stricter importation rules on seafood, followed by the US. And just last year, Japan announced that they're changing national laws. That's the second largest seafood market in the world. So all of these regulatory and market changes are driving digitization. So we don't just want to digitize the seafood industry, though. What we want to do is uh, generate new insights and value from, from all this data. So we're now advancing some of the, uh, I think, uh, cutting edge advances in AI in the seafood industry. We've developed uh, an AI-enabled app called Tallybot, which uh, enables process automation and predictive analytics in the seafood sector. And I kind of look at Tallybot a little bit like the R2-D2 of seafood processors. For those of you who are Star Wars fans, you know that R2 is an industrial automation droid uh, that's built for, to be a mechanic and, and computer backup for spacecrafts. Well, in the same way, we've developed Tallybot so that we can embed it in all the digital workflows throughout the factory to perform many, many tasks. So we can program Tallybot with standard algorithms uh, to verify data, to do complex calculations, to send alerts to supervisors when things go wrong, or to automate quality control checks. And we can also program Tallybot with uh, uh, machine learning algorithms for predictive analytics. And we've tried to give Tallybot a bit of personality with some color and expressions, because what we want to do is communicate to workers that Tallybot is their friend, not a foe. It's something, uh, technology that's there to help them. And I think 
Uh, AI has a lot of promise in the seafood industry, and one of the reasons for that is because there's a lot of natural variability in seafood, which means that it's very hard for seafood producers to often predict production or quality outcomes. So that's a perfect problem uh, for AI. So for instance, there are just too many variables uh, to compute production yields or to predict production yields in factories. So in fact, what we did is we took three years of data from a tuna cannery in, in Bangkok and we actually built a yield prediction model so that the company can predict what their production outcomes will be even before they start manufacturing. We're also working with a Vancouver company and with some funding from Innovate BC uh, to build a computer vision model. So we're taking video of fish fillets and then we'll uh, use a computer vision algorithm to automatically classify the fish by size, color, and defects. And ultimately, our ultimate goal is really to connect farm to factory so that we can understand what farm practices are leading to better quality and production outcomes at the factory level. So, you know, in many ways, Canadians are still loggers, miners, and fishers. It's just that you know, we're logging into computers, computers mining Bitcoin, uh, and I hope none of you are actually sending out phishing e emails. So. But kidding aside, you know, I think a, a lot of investors and even some politicians kind of like to dismiss the, the old traditional industries kind of as a bygone industry. But you know, in, a, in a world of climate change, population growth, pandemics, and even war that's causing supply chain disruptions and uh, inflation, food security is becoming more important than ever. And you can't eat uh, crypto or an N NFT, but you can eat seafood chowder, shrimp pasta, and smoked salmon, which is apparently what they're serving for lunch at the conference today. <laughs> so enjoy your seafood lunch, and thanks for listening. Thanks, everyone. Really happy to be here today. Um, I'm the director of product at Lamazoo, and I'm going to talk today about data visualization in mixed realities, um, and a little bit about how digital twins are helping people communicate. So Lamazoo is a digital twin software platform with a growing set of mixed reality products. And our clients use our product to build digital twins of very large spaces. Uh, smaller spaces like buildings and rooms or factories and even down to smaller things, actual objects. And we believe that digital twins are an ideal environment to bring people and data together. And I'm just going to pause here a little bit and uh, go through some, I'll just show you some visuals of our product. This is a, this is a large scale, very accurate 3D model of, of a portion of BC. Um, we, we can zoom in a little bit. You can see that we can start overlaying, overlaying data sets on top of that model or within that model in a whole bunch of different categories that you can turn on and off. Fire data. We can do visualizations of various levels of realism. We can do three-dimensional models of things that are underground. <clears throat> We can show different data sets in different ways. This is a, an ore body within, you know, underground with the drilling holes in it. Um, this is that same ore body with a visualization of the trucks that are hauling the ore. Um, this, is a, this is one of our interfaces in our virtual reality headset. So you can actually view our software on a desktop or you can don a, um, a virtual reality headset and be completely immersed in the environment. Uh, and you, we can additionally do uh, AR. So I'll, I'll, I'll just pause for a second right here um, and, and continue. Um, so we've heard today from a couple of speakers actually that there's this explosion of data that's been happening. We're all aware of that. What's really, I, I think, unique or important about in recent times is the, the explosion of data a huge portion of it is actually spatial in nature. And our ability, our, our newfound ability to collect this data at incredible, incredible rates is a double-edged sword. It's really great that we have a lot of data, but that data is often difficult to work with. So 
just some examples, you know, geolocated imagery, video, audio, photogrammetry, uh, LIDAR, which is a laser scanning technology. Um, if you have a new iPhone, you actually have a LIDAR scanner on the new iPhone that you can just pass around an object and it will create a 3D model of that object. Satellites, visible and non-visible uh, spectrums, billions of IoT devices of different, uh, uh, different kinds, and we can take all of these sensors and now we can attach them to drones and fly the drones around. So our ability to capture data is incredible. But these data sets, they're very informative, but they're very difficult to work with. Um, and generally, um, they're kind of difficult to combine. You often find one data set in one domain and it tends to stay there. And so, Lamazoo, what the problem that Lamazoo is solving or the problem that we're pushing against, if we boil it right down, it's the data utility problem. Most of the data, as we heard, that organizations collect goes unused or of the data that is used, it's used by a narrow group of people and everybody else doesn't get to see it or has difficulty accessing it. And so we try and make, uh, what we're doing at Lamazoo is we're trying to take all of these different disparate data sets that currently live in different silos that are kind of, uh, that are kind of meaningful to one group of people and we're trying to mash them together into an environment that allows more people to benefit from, from those data sets. And make it so easy um, that, that more and more people can benefit from more and more data sets. And so the way that we kind of, the way that we state our problem statement, it is the three C's, communication, coordination, and collaboration among stakeholders is really difficult, inefficient, ineffective and sometimes even impossible when the stakeholders don't have the data or the information they need to make these decisions or just have a better conversation. <clears throat> so our clients tell us that by taking these different data sets and putting them into a common environment, an environment that everybody, all the stakeholders around the table can understand, can relate to, that that helps drive better conversations. And that drives a bunch of, of positive outcomes, whether it's gaining alignment or, or um, getting a deal done faster or deciding that, deciding to move forward versus not move forward for certain reasons. These environments are bringing people and data together in a way that help them communicate better. And so, you know, our vision is we want to we want to make creating and maintaining a digital twin as easy as creating a PowerPoint. And you know, if we can do that, then we can start enabling the kinds of things like we want miners and foresters to see the land through the eyes of First Nations. We want First Nations to combine their traditional use knowledge with modern climatology data. We want to push those things together and essentially see what greatness happens. Um, you know, and, and I think Lamazoo's already experienced this. We want politicians and leaders of different kinds to be able to be immersed in the data from all of the different stakeholders so that there's a more, whole, a, a more fulsome understanding of the situation. And, and that all of the diverse stakeholders can use these environments to have better, um, to, to drive better outcomes. So the, the earth is facing a few challenges, as we know, um, and many of the challenges that are facing us are, the, are of the kind where the three C's are really important, right? We, in order to address the climate change challenges and, and all, you know, all of, those, uh, all of those sort of large challenges, the degree, the speed at which we have to move, the degree of collaboration, the degree of communication and coordination that has to happen in order to you know, turn this really big ship, um, we haven't seen that really, 
I, I suppose the best example, the most recent example was COVID, right? COVID really caused a massive amount of communication, coordination, and collaboration to solve that problem. We have a bunch of those kinds of problems that are coming down the pike, and we have to, um, we have to address those. So what Lamazoo is going to do is we're going to put these kinds of data visualization tools, these kind of contextual data-rich environments into the hands of leaders, and we're going to let them do their best work. And so um, I think uh, to wrap up, what's really important, I think, the, a message I want to leave all of you is Lamazoo will do the job of data visualization and data contextualization and create environments that allow people to communicate better, but it's of no use unless there are other really smart people bringing new data sets to the table, new AI models, new visualizations, new simulations, all of those kinds of things. So we, LUMS is very open and works with, you know, academia as well as industry in order to identify these types of, um, these types of data sets and the different types of data visualizations that can be brought into an environment where people can share, learn, and make better decisions. And I'll stop there. Thank you.